got the great, great pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, Elizabeth Dillo, who is a founding principal of Dillo, Scofidio and Renfro, an interdisciplinary design studio that integrates architecture, visual arts, performing arts, and many other things. Dillo, Scofidio and Renfro's project include the Lincoln Center expansion in New York, 2008 to 2010, the ICA in Boston, 2006, the Blur Building in Switzerland, 2002, one of the most extraordinary experiences for me ever to visit this building in um, uh, the French part of Switzerland for the Swiss Expo in 2002, where Dillos, Cofidio and Renfro made a garden, one can say, of fog, and it ties in with what Etel Nan talked about earlier today, also her extraordinary new text about uh, fog and the garden of fog. And last but not least, there is obviously the project of the High Line, which is Dillos, Cofidio and Renfro's recent uh, project concerning an urban park situated on an obsolete elevated railway stretching. It's one and a half miles long through the Chelsea area of New York City. The Los Cofidio Renfrew are recipients of uh, MacArthur Genius Awards, many other awards, and in 2003, the Whitney Museum had a retrospective. A very warm welcome to Elizabeth Dillon. Okay. Um, Hans is the only uh, person I know that could uh, make an intellectual exchange into an endurance sport. Um, so before hypothermia sets in, I'm quickly um, go through my presentation. So in 2002, uh, we became um, part of one of the most unusual uh, urban planning initiatives in New York, um, the High Line. We did this with uh, Pete Udolf, who's um, in the pavilion uh, now, and also field operations. Um, the High Line is an elevated industrial railway that stretches 1.5 miles uh, from Greenwich Village um, uh, all the way up through 34th Street in the Hudson Yards. And it slices through urban landscape indiscriminately. So here's a plan, and this is um, what we found uh, before we started. Um, so uh, just a little bit of background, I won't go through this too much, um, but in the mid-19th century, uh, cargo arriving by ship uh, at the west side of Manhattan was distributed by train along 10th Avenue to factories and to warehouses. And as the population grew, so did pedestrian conflicts. Uh, trains often ran over pedestrians, um, and so this is, uh, it, it became known as uh, Death Avenue. Uh, this this 10th Avenue, and you see this cowboy escorting the train. Uh, this is what uh, took place. At a certain point, um, they decided to build High Line 30 feet in the air uh, to avoid these pedestrian conflicts. So that was in the 1930s. Um, anyway, it it uh, ran for about 50 years, um, and then uh, the last train load of uh, uh, of uh, cargo was frozen turkeys. And the highway system essentially uh, established itself and replaced the railway as a delivery system. Um, in, the, in the 80s, artists and architects became more conscious of the High Line. Dio opened Chelsea, paving the way for a new gallery district. Um, and then um, it fell into disuse. Uh, and at a certain point, it was just a, a sea of open parking lots. Um, and uh, industrial aging, uh, 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 semi-industrial aging buildings. Um, and this group of property owners uh, felt that the uh, property values uh, really went down in that area and they wanted the High Line demolished. Uh, and so they got a demolition order uh, to, to take down five blocks. Uh, and at that point, a, a couple of citizen activists uh, mounted a grassroots campaign for the preservation and reuse of the High Line. Um, this is what you saw uh, crossing the streets. Um, this is what it actually was, and this is really uh, quite amazing um, after it became a ruin. Just the kind of growth that took place there, and you could see the variety of different uh, species, actually, of what we would normally call weeds, basically. Um, and the way that the founders of the High Line argued uh, uh, the value to the city and to, pr to preservation uh, was that it would act as a catalyst for development, much like Central Park did uh, for Midtown and Uptown in New York. 
Anyway, um, so some of those early photographs of the ruin of the Highland were taken by uh, Joel Sternfeld, and it's amazing about the power, political power of photography, um, because despite the fact that Giuliani, as his last act as mayor, ordered the demolition of the Highline entirely, um, it was saved the moment that the Mo Bloomberg administration uh, came, because somehow those photos made palpable the potential of the High Line as a, pu a public park. And I'm gonna just take you through some of our thinking. Uh, it was amazing because um, these are the, the plants that, that grew there. There are microclimates, microenvironments um, that just uh, took root just because some of the areas were shady, some of them were windblown, some of them were sun, sun drenched. And so uh, there was a little microsystem that sort of um, uh, 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 took root um, in various uh, um, portions, every block or every other block. And there was flora and fauna that was this kind of very weird urban condition. Um, so here are some more. Um, it was uh, when we went into this competition, international competition, uh, we decided that uh, the problem uh, with, with this uh, uh, potential um, uh, park was, um, well, first of all, that it was very melancholic and that you had to preserve somehow that melancholia. And how do you do that? Second, it was a very practical problem um, that in order to, um, to bring the public up, you would destroy the ecosystem. So you had to somehow rebuild it. If you uh, put anything live there, you would have uh, basically a, a path and um, some, uh, uh, some live material. And because it was so narrow, um, so uh, we were very much stimulated by the way that um, uh, that nature somehow um, uh, uh, makes a conquest over built uh, built artifact, uh, as in these kind of cracks in the sidewalk and the way that uh, plant life takes over. So we invented this this system um, that we call a kind of agritecture. Basically, um, it's a cultivation of the, the kind of plant life that was uh, originally there, but interspersing it in uh, to hard material. Um, so uh, we basically digitized the surface of the High Line um, and produced a kind of a unit of paving, uh, which has a, as its characteristic a tapering form. And it uh, combs together with the biological material uh, in different ways and in different proportions. So these are some of the precast concrete units um, and these were anticipated uh, growths. Um, and as you go along the High Line in different proportions, uh, there would be a different percentage of hardscape uh, to green. Uh, we also had a master plan um, that, uh, that had various activities along it. Um, we tried to suppress architecture as much as possible collectively. Um, but the city had to think uh, uh, about everything for the first time, how to secure the High Line, how to, uh, uh, how to dispose of garbage, how to, uh, um, how to uh, dispose of, of, of snow, uh, everything. It was really kind of miraculous in the city. One of the uh, thoughts is that the um, access to the High Line were different durations rather than um, uh, elevators and, and, and stairs. There were just durations of access. Um, these are some of the construction shots. And um, the system um, extended into benches and into bringing back uh, some of the uh, tracks. Um, I should say here that, that um, this, this um, uh, post-industrial uh, landscape was kind of really important to rethink um, in a culture of leisure. And uh, so it is very much in our minds that when you're there, um, that sense of the past is, is always with you. Um, and so it's not a place to have fun. And in fact, it's very slow. Parallel to it is, is Hudson River Park um, that runs along the Hudson River next to the highway. Fast moving traffic, uh, lots of bikes, rollerblades, um, runners. Here, there's nothing of that. There's really nothing to do um, but just walk. And so uh, section two was just completed. There are three sections, 1.5 miles altogether. Um, some of these photographs are Iwan Bon. Uh, he really uh, did a spectacular job 
So this is a part of section one, and I'm just going to randomly um, show some, some great photos of this. This is looking north uh, around 18th Street. This is the entrance. And we made explicit the kind of section cut that was there where uh, Giuliani removed the first five blocks. So you actually see a section cut through the soil. And there's a slow entrance. Uh, we repurpose some of the um, some of the elements. Um, so there are different sections and different atmospheres all throughout, and you could see how lush um, it is and how much growth there is in just uh, two years. Um, what's beautiful is um, is is the. Um, is, is actually the surroundings. And you know, we didn't make it, we just, we found it. Um, it's very kind of, uh, uh, kind of s somewhat dystopian, uh, this entrance. Um, and we are simply uh, kind of, uh, you know, watching it grow around us. You know, we are now, it used to be that, uh, um, that this was just a void you know, in, in an urban solid, and now it becomes an object in an open field and just to be surrounded by new buildings in the future. Um, part of what's, what makes it so strong is that there are these uh, blank walls. It was never intended um, uh, that there was any kind of uh, relationship, you know, other than an industrial one between the High Line and the surrounding buildings. And so there are these solid walls, um, sometimes industrial artifacts like smokestacks. Um, but the solid walls are very uh, powerful. And what's interesting is in the new development, uh, there are all these sites that have uh, turned over uh, from one developer to another developer, and um, it's um, it's 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 pretty interesting the uh, the the value how the value of property has escalated, um, and as the uh, as those sites are built on, there's a kind of phototropic effect where all of a sudden the windows are migrating to the high line. So um, kind of like um, so here's you know here are the solid walls. And, um, and, and this is one of the new developments. This is an Yeldonari building. It's one of the nicer ones. Um, but there are many very uh, ugly ones. And the question is how long um, will this really stay um, strong? I mean, is it, is it possible that the High Line will endure um, some of the bad uh, 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 developments that are uh, right next to it? Um, so. I'll just flip through some more slides. Different atmospheres, uh, the High Line goes through buildings, uh, uh, lighting effects. Um, the, the High Line at a certain point flies over, um, the walkway flies over the greenscape, so it's 100% green. Um, and all sorts of unusual things just happen and you um, see some weird things all the time. Uh, it kind of, uh, the weirder, the better. Um, we were um, actually asked to do um, uh, a roller rink and beer garden just uh, on an uh, anticipated uh, building site right uh, near 30, uh, 30th Street. S super cheap. Um, this is one of the overlooks. These, I mean, this is one of the great things. There are all these um, um, really nasty sites uh, there that all of a sudden, from this privileged point of view, look really exotic. And then uh, the, the view is always two-way. Uh, this is uh, the spur uh, uh, that crosses uh, 10th Avenue. And this was the way it, uh, it was before we found it. And we simply cut out the steel, uh, put in a little grandstand, and replaced this, the steel clad with glass. And so now, um, uh, so this is the plan view. So the public can um, look through this and witness the uh, taillights of cars on 10th Avenue. Um, I think one of the successes of the High Line is um, uh, the, the notion of introducing the concept of doing nothing to New Yorkers. Uh, if we're not in our offices being productive, we're at the gym burning calories or at uh, the park walking our dogs, or between these points consulting our devices. The High Line doesn't offer much to do. You can walk or sit, 
or you can stare at taillights. Um, and very much the way we stare into a fireplace or a lava lamp. It's very um, Seinfeld. Um, and, and talking about Seinfeld, uh, this Curb Your Enthusiasm was shot there. Uh, it's become um, a really popular spot. Uh, this is a, a scene from The Family Guy. Uh, and uh, I don't know, some superhero comics. Uh, anyway, I'll just zap through this. A lot of unconventional things have happened. This is uh, the standard hotel that overlooks the High Line. Uh, there are performances that sort of happen uh, all the time. And it's kind of become a spectator sport. Um, one of the really unusual things was there, there was a construction light on this tenement building uh, just accidentally focused on a window. It turns out that a cabaret singer uh, lived behind there and would come out every night on her fire escape and do a performance. The renegade cabaret. So there are all these unusual behaviors that were never predicted and they keep happening. Uh, the High Line became a gold mine. Um, all these properties are being built on or have been built on um, for a cost of, a, of 153 uh, million. So uh, uh, the city has uh, basically generated two billion dollars in, in new developments. Um, so this notion of uh, a high line as a catalyst has really paid off. Um, there are high lines that proliferate all over the world these days. Um, but you know, everyone is uh, is kind of making a buck on it um, just by using the name Highline. Um, there are Highline products uh, and Sex in the City. Uh, uh, well, we're we're also we also take advantage of the hype. Uh, this was the uh, Miss Meat Packing District uh, <laughs> uh, gown competition. This was ours. We won. Um, and this is the, um, the timeline, this five years that the original, um, the, 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 we had to remediate, so we had to remove everything, but in the replanting, the birds and the plant life come back really in five years, and then there's very little maintenance um, as that happens. And um, we, we were struggling for a long time uh, uh, about the issue of um, this kind of conflict between preserving the beauty of the natural, nat uh, natural decay of the High Line um, and the natural growth of the city, even if it's based on speculation and motivated by profit. So um, we kind of are giving in. I mean, we think that it's, it's okay. Um, there's all sorts of stuff that, um, that, you know, that, that happens, all these new activities, and many that are unanticipated. Um, so, um, a couple of final words. Urban parks are typically, typically an escape from the city. You go to the High Line to re-enter the city, uh, except it's the city's unconscious, the imperfect, the unintended, the overlooked, the blank party walls and innards of buildings, the loading docks and chop shops at arm's distance from cars parked uh, up in the air on mechanical lift lifts next to fire escapes, smokestacks, floating at the height of giant underwear ads. Um, uh, Lori, uh, well, anyway, um, even as the condos go up, uh, the High Line, uh, we feel, will always um, be unfit. Uh, it doesn't neatly fit into the logics of the city. Uh, so despite what happens. Um, this act accidental ecosystem that we found at the beginning of the project has spawned a new ecosystem in which natives, tourists, artists, executives, socialites, club kids, cruisers, retirees, sunbathers, fitness buffs, fashionistas, and even flashers produce a new biodiversity that is pure New York. Thank you.